Hey, everyone. Welcome to TechCrunch Live, where founders help other founders build venture-backed businesses. And today, we are live in Atlanta. Well, kind of. I'm home in Michigan, but all the guests and all the startups and all the investors are from Atlanta. So we're, we're excited to be here. And once upon a time, TechCrunch hosted meetups around the country and no other city, I'm going to go on record saying this, no other city showed up like Atlanta did. And the same is true today. We have hundreds of people watching live. We have fantastic participation across the board. And, and you want to know why? It's because everyone wants Atlanta to succeed. But let's go over today's agenda. There's a lot going on. First, we have TechCrunch writer Dominic Midori Davis speaking to Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens on his effort to support and grow the tech community there. This should be great. Mayor Dickens has been very vocal about his support for the tech community. And Atlanta is full of colleges turning out amazing tech talent. And we want to talk to him about his efforts to support and grow that, that ecosystem there. Next, we have... Next, <laughs> Dominic is talking to Rodney Sampson about uh, the equality or the economy of, of equality and his efforts to bring the the different groups together within the Atlanta region. Last, we have Becca Suzak talking to two local invest investors about the different uh, areas within Atlanta that are getting funding. We do this type of, of panel on every city spotlight we do. Why? Because we want to tell you who is funding startups and who's not, who's writing checks and who, and who is not writing checks and what type of startups are getting funded. So with that, I want to thank you once again for joining us on this special city spotlight uh, TechCrunch live edition. With that, I'm going to turn the show over to Dom. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mayor Dickens. Um, thank you so much for making the time for us today. I'm really excited to dive into this panel. So let's get started. Um, first question, you were born and raised in Atlanta. So how have you seen the entrepreneurship ecosystem evolve and change over these past few decades? Yeah, so, you know, I was born and raised in Atlanta uh, four decades ago. Um, and to be able to lead a city that I've grown up in and been an entrepreneur in, someone who started my own business, I've been in a technology space and the, uh, home goods, furniture space. And uh, it's been phenomenal to watch this city grow from a Southern jewel with charm to now an international city, uh, one of the epicenters uh, of the tech ecosystem to my alma mater, Georgia Tech, going from this small, you know, middle-sized school to a large uh, school with a sprawling campus that produces a significant amount of technology talent across the United States. Um, and produces a lot of entrepreneurs that are creating fantastic uh, businesses and ideas that are really uh, some are disruptive and you know changing the way we do business and the way we communicate. And others are just uh, super helpful, um, you know, supportive businesses that are really um, you know significant in the in the culture today. And so uh, Atlanta has just grown to now where. Uh, everybody, lots of companies want to be here. Lots of people move here uh, and lots of great uh, things are happening. So, you know, the, the business ecosystem, it's a great place to start a business. And um, I'm the chairman of our board of the uh, Invest Atlanta, which is our economic development arm that really does loans, does grants, does, uh, you know, opportunities and training and support for small to medium to even large businesses. So it's been fantastic to see our rapid growth in the city of Atlanta, particularly in the business and technology space. And what do you think happened that has caused so so much interest in Atlanta and um, like making so many people want to come? I know it, it can't just be the remote work movement. Like, what is attracting <laughs> all these people and tech players to Atlanta? Well, I think it started a little while before just the pandemic and the remote working environment. I mean, we have the world's busiest airport. So that's one thing. Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport is the world's busiest and the most efficient airport. So you can get from Hartsfield Jackson from Atlanta to 20 to 80 percent of the United States in just a two hour direct flight. Um, which is significant for business productivity, for leisure travel all across the world, you can get from this airport. Uh, but also our weather is fantastic, our festivals, our culture, the people are just cool and very um, 
very, uh, you know, hospitable, but it's our uh, academic institutions, the HBCUs that are here, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, uh, Morris Brown, uh, and, and, and others, including uh, Georgia Tech, Georgia State, Emory. We have so much talent that is right in this city center that is just, you know, that 18 to 25 year old space of grad students, undergrads, doctorate students, it is happening here. So companies are coming here because they can access all this great talent. And from a black perspective, black, this is the uh, second highest uh, concentration of black folks with degrees and bachelor's degrees that are here in Atlanta. So uh, technology uh, growth happens right here uh, because of that talent. And last but not least, we're starting an ecosystem here where, you know, Microsoft is coming, Google, Cisco, Visa, Airbnb, BlackRock, Nike, Walmart, um, you name it. They all have a presence here. Uh, NCR, 70% of the transactions in the world take place right here in the city of Atlanta with First Data, Equifax, uh, NCR, uh, and you name it. So I just think it's uh, it's our time. It's, uh, you know, a great place to be where the stars are really aligning. And it's a fun place to be. You can't you can't forget the fact that uh, we're number one in TV and film uh, with all the hip hop music, R&B music, and even, you know, some country music and gospel music is produced here. So when you come here for a technology job or you come here to start a business, you also are coming into a sport, sports and entertainment culture uh, with great weather and a great airport that is really undeniable that. And you got good city leadership, if I must say so myself as the mayor of Atlanta uh, on a legacy of other great leaders. And there's a lot of things that, of course, draw people to Atlanta. But I'm also really curious, because um, Atlanta is, a, 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 politically speaking, it's a blue city mm -hmm. within what is, you know, historically been somewhat of a red state. Um, and so how do you see that tension um, impacting uh, the city's tech growth? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm glad you pointed that out. So, you know, the city of Atlanta is definitely a blue city, uh, a city that's very much, uh, you know, a, a darling of the Democratic Party, um, the history of civil rights being here. You know, Atlanta gets a lot of things right in terms of uh, progressive culture. But we're inside of a state that's big, it's one of the fifth largest, largest state in the nation. It's a huge, uh, you know, significant state. And outside of Atlanta, you only got a few other pockets of blue. The rest of it has, ten, you know, has tended to be red. But as we saw in the 2020 election of Biden and the 2021 uh, election of two senators, uh, Ossoff and Warnock, and then the re-election of Warnock in 22, uh, Georgia has come around and more people uh, are now, you know, we're kind of purple, bluish, <laughs> bluish green, uh, bluish uh, red, we're purple. And I think that that boasts well for us. It keeps us at the center point of all political discussions, Republicans, Democrats, otherwise. Uh, folks want to do business in Atlanta. Folks want to do business in Georgia. It's a business-friendly state. It's actually listed for the ninth year in a row as the number one place in America to do business, the number one state. And Atlanta has a lot to do with it and our people. And so... You know, we have the third highest concentration of Fortune 500 companies right here in Atlanta. So, you know, you think about all the cities in the nation. You got some New York, you got Chicago, Miami, great cities, L.A., San Francisco, uh, Denver, et cetera. But you also have this beautiful city of Atlanta. That's the third highest concentration. And we had a lot of um, companies that just say, I just got to be in Atlanta because you, you got what it takes and business is, uh, we, we, we do social justice well, but we also do business well. So, and we were, you know, families want to move here and people want to do, uh, great things, live out their ambitious goals and dreams here. Like, um, and so that's, you know, that, that really gives people momentum. So you're not worried at all that, um, perhaps state politics might make talent or tech talent lead to more blue states in any way? Well, um, I hope not. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm always watchful of that. Uh, you know, we've lived a life where tech uh, companies, tech, tech, biz, uh, tech folks, you know, in Atlanta graduating from Georgia Tech and these colleges, you know, they used to bleed out to the coast. They would go to Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, L.A., or to the Boston, New York. And those are definitely all, you know, clearly strongholds of blue, blue uh, Democratic liberal cities and states. 
and they would go to those places. And that was where a lot of the academic talent was and a lot of corporations are. Well, now you come to a state like Georgia, come to a city like Atlanta, where it's lower cost. Uh, so you can fund, you know, funders and VCs can, you can get a lot of bang for their buck by investing in a company in Atlanta. You know, our housing uh, costs are less. Our cost of living is less. It's not free. And, you know, it's rising um, as, as all things are rising in the nation due to inflation. But I think that folks are finding, you know, politics aside, there's there's ways where the city and state work together. We work together on business. We get business right. And then there are some other things that we definitely have disagreements on, certain social issues. Um, and so we manage those in the city. We fight when we need to fight and disagree when we need to disagree. But the things that we agree on, which is economic development, business, uh, think about it. We're now the electric vehicle capital of the United States. The electric batteries are being made here, more of them uh, than anywhere else. And all of the, you know, and, 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 and that's progressive for a state that's red, right? You got a lot of interest in making sure that we are moving forward with technology and, and auto and, uh, and the automotive industry, which typically was somewhere else in the nation. So um, we're doing our part to make sure we uh, city and state get along, red and blue, find out where we work together and where we disagree. We know where the uh, boxing match is that we, we, we can go there and duke it out and then go back over here to, to the boardroom. And I wanted to talk to you about income immobility and classism um, just a bit. How do you break or how do you help people break into, you know, this like growing tech sector sector in Atlanta when tech itself is kind of a bubble? Yeah, so that's my goal. That's my interest. That's why I'm in this is to make sure that there's equity and opportunities for everybody. If we know that, I mean, we've known this for the last 10 to 15 years that the tech sector is the uh, is the sector that has the highest growth potential and the highest income uh, uh, wealth potential. Uh, and so making sure that people have more access to these jobs, more access to the training and career paths so that they can be on a pathway to making money for their family to overcome generational poverty, uh, multi-generational poverty. That's why I'm in it. You know, I was the first in my family to go to college when I went to Georgia Tech to get an engineering degree. I don't want anybody else to continue to, you know, 20 years from now, we still have firsts in our families. We want to make sure that we're going on our second and third generation of people going to college or technical school to get the training, to get these great jobs and to start their own businesses even. And so what I've been focused on is, you know, whether you have a four year degree or to help people get certifications in applications, de application development or software development or even uh, coding and et cetera, just to be able to uh, make a mid middle wage income by being able to manipulate some reports or, you know, for a service now, a Salesforce, or AWS, uh, um you know, any kind of uh, language, you know, cybersecurity, these things you can get uh, in 16 week or, you know, 20 week training programs. We're paying, you know, for the tests, we're paying for the training. We're making sure people in Atlanta can get access to these uh, 50, 60, $70,000 jobs with or without a college degree. And that is where we're trying to take people from poverty to prosperity uh, to help them be able to be uh, self-sufficient. And that's the goal is to constantly train people And that, you know, some of that talent is in college, paying college loans. And some of this talent is working at, you know, uh, retail jobs, hotel jobs or warehouse jobs that need to get on this fast track of technology. And so we're trying to help people do that so that we can overcome generations and generations of uh, living, you know, paycheck to paycheck, but now go into this place where you can have a great career in technology. Um, and it's, and it's working. It's literally working at my, you know, former employer before I became mayor tech bridge. We train thousands of people right now on technology careers uh, and they don't have to have college degrees. Um, and so are other, you know, startup organizations and nonprofits and for profits are doing that. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful thing, uh, you know. And then the other thing that we're doing in Atlanta is making sure that we're a customer to startups. Uh, so startups need capital. They need talent and they need customers. As Donnie Beamer, my senior technology advisor, always says, we need those three things and that talent. We have it. 
the the the, the capital. We're, we're getting more of that. Some of us coming from the city. Some of us coming from the investment community. And then we need customers. The city needs to be a customer. All these Fortune 500s here need to be customers. And when when, the, when we're we have a great ecosystem like that, then you'll have more and more people within the economy able to make more money and feed their families and escape some of the social ills and poverty. And you kind of brought up two points that I wanted to hit on. Um, first of which was talking about education. Um, we spoke, or we all know that there's like, a, you know, a dearth of black talent, uh, or not ta black talent, but there's there's black talent. We just have to, you know, get them. And so I was going to ask you, how do you plan to leverage the HBCUs in the area to create uh, like a more robust pipeline of black talent to filter into this um, the tech ecosystem? Well, that's the beautiful thing about Atlanta. You know, um, diversity is in our DNA. Black talent just comes with uh, when you move to Atlanta, you know, or you visit Atlanta, you see it every day. You see it all over. The HBCUs, the Morehouse, Spelman, you know, AUC, they produced talent in the 60s and 50s that were the ones that led the revolution, led the civil rights movement. And so now it's time to have them lead, you know, be a part of and lead this digital revolution. You know, this, 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 uh, uh, silver rights where we were in civil rights before. And so we, um, are working directly with them, connecting them to, uh, internships and jobs with a number of, uh, technology companies that are here, uh, because what we have expressed to the corporations and many of them got it already. They, they, they have diversity and equity and inclusion as part of their mission. They also have social uh, responsibility part of their mission. But some of them don't always know what to do with that title and what, you know, they talk about it, but don't always know how to implement it. So we're sharing with them that you be in less trouble when you build your app with black and minority uh, designers on the design room floor. When they when when, when you're at the table making decisions with everybody else, then glitches and problems of oversight, implicit bias, and, um, you know, these things that we've seen plague some of these, um, some of these apps and some of these corporations that have, uh, you know, you know, I don't want to give names, but if you're, you know, a ride share application or an overnight stay, uh, you know, a short-term rental company, some of these, you know, dilemmas that they face because, um, you know, the bias of the uh, user, the provider is, you know, would have been easily seen by a black person being at the design table, being able to say, you know, if we let this app out like this, folks are going to, um, be able to discriminate against some of our users because of their name or because of their skin color or because of, you know, this or that. And so they won't be able to get a ride or they won't be able to get a night stay. And so we've now convinced folks that, you know, diversity is not charity. Diversity is good for business. Uh, diversity helps you be able to see more of the customer base, be able to make more revenue, save more money, be able to produce better outcomes and be more transformative. And when our folks graduate from these HBCUs or graduate from our local high schools and go on a technical career, technical colleges uh, right here in Atlanta, and they come out and they start working for these companies, you you have um, diversity built into your already into your company fiber. So when you put out a product, you put out a design it already is sensitive and aware of all of the social uh, challenges that could have come up, could have come up, have already uh, for the most part been eliminated. And as tech's presence in Atlanta continues to grow, um, how are you anticipating the ways in which everything or how it will impact um, Atlanta's urban planning or other challenges and issues that might arise as more companies move in as, and as more people come into the area and region? Yeah, you know, you could become a victim of your own success. And Atlanta has been, you know, trying to deal with that challenge. We, we've seen other cities, uh, they cost more money. Uh, they cost more now that they have prosperity, even more prosperity than they had had even assumed. So the, the, the revenue that the city is making is great because more tall buildings, more uh, city taxes are collected because more land is being used with more um more, you know, commercial in, in, in uh, commercial property income. So more sales taxes. So yes, it's great, but we want to have balanced growth. We want to have growth that is balanced, meaning I don't want just growth. We want growth that considers everybody because we don't want gentrification. 
and that definitely not negative gentrification where people that have been long long term residents, legacy residents of the city of Atlanta, people that's been here 30, 40 years, you know, two, three, four generations of Atlantans like my family that can't keep up with the rising cost of goods and services as well as uh, the cost of housing. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that we balance out the, the, the growth that we're getting. We're trying to say, hey, you know, we want everybody to be able to participate in these jobs, how to tap into that untapped talent, how to make sure that, you know, we don't import all of our talent from the coasts. So I've had conversations with the same companies that we're talking about that's coming here. They're getting a th- they're doing a thousand jobs in Atlanta, 5,000 jobs. Some have advertised as many as 10,000 jobs. And so what I tell them is, it's great. I'm not cutting the ribbon if the goal is for you to import everybody from uh, a high cost area just to come into Atlanta. We're going to have to make sure that some 30, 40 percent of this thousand employees that you're going to need or 10,000 employees that they come from the metro Atlanta area. So you don't over upset our ecosystem so that you don't import talent of people that can't live off of a quarter million dollars where they're coming from and come here to an environment where, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, you're living very good. Why don't we grow a hundred thousand heirs from Atlanta? Why don't we train people over this year that it's going to take you to build your building, get your facility straight, figure out all that you're doing. Why don't we train, you know, 500 people, 400 people, whatever the number is so that we can have, you know, when I cut the ribbon, my folks from, you know, Atlanta are moving right into their desk um, versus somebody coming here with a moving truck uh, and, and they got to figure out Atlanta. And meanwhile, they just bought Miss Jones's house for three times as much as what she, you know, paid for it. I don't want that. That's going to cause us social challenges. And then we'll be like some other cities where you um, no one lives in the city. They, they live way out. And they come in and, and they're the ones that, you know, our, our, our firefighters can't live in the city. Our nurses can't afford to live in the city. Our teachers can't afford to live in the city. Our hotel uh, staff and people that are our restauranteurs, you know, they just can't afford to live in the city. We don't want to be that. We don't want to outpace ourselves and, and have growth that doesn't include everybody. So how to do that? Very hard work, but you have to state it. You have to name it. You have to say it clearly to corporations. What's your local hiring and training plan? It's not that I dislike folks coming. You know, we're all about being hospitable and inviting, but I just can't I can't sign off on any incentives for your company to come here if you don't have a local hiring plan. And shortly before this event, I did a call out on social media to round up some audience questions. And after going through them, I'm going to see if I have time to ask two, but most realistically one. Um, someone from Twitter wants to know, how can Atlanta make free and public spaces available for the entrepreneurial ecosystem? And what spaces are available for entrepreneurs to co-work in other than just the paid co-working spaces? Wow, that's a good question. Um, one, I would probably say it's not enough. Um, just based on my initial gut reaction to the question, um, free is hard these days, right? I mean, you know, free space, free Wi-Fi, free, like, you know, besides the library, uh, besides, you know, you can post up at some of our, uh, you know, parks and recreation places, our city hall and those places. Um, but what constitutes a, 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 um, a shared workspace? Um, including printing and all, you know, free coffee and, you know, your great um, conference rooms and those things. A lot of those come with paid memberships uh, to the subscription-based. Um, some are, you know, like the Gathering Spot, uh, the Russell Center um, in Atlanta, which are great, phenomenal Black-owned places that uh, are fostering a lot of entrepreneurs. But, um, you know, maybe there might be a space for um, some free uh, stuff outside of, like I said, our libraries, our parks and recs, our community centers. Um, maybe there's something else that we can look into uh, and, and help. Now, we have a lot of, you know, we have programs. We have the the, the largest free um, women's entrepreneurship program in, in Atlanta. There's a cohort every, uh, I think about every five, every six months that's for women entrepreneurs. We have 15 going through each each time, and it's the largest municipally funded uh, women's initiative. So 
uh, for entrepreneurs. And so we, we're doing a great job at that. We're at uh, entrepreneur number 75 now. So uh, stay tuned for that. And so that's one that's good. And all those women have a space. Uh, they work as a cohort. Some are in technology, some are in home goods, beauty products, uh, you name it, um, you know, hygiene and everything else, uh, healthcare products. Uh, so those women are helping getting a good start because they work with the city of Atlanta. Maybe we should do more programs like that. And I'm going to try to ask this last question. Okay. An Atlanta native on Twitter asked, during the summer, Atlanta has a tradition with its youth becoming young entrepreneurs, typically through selling water, and are known as the water kids. Um, has there been any thoughts on efforts to convert those kids on the streets into early tech programs? We actually do. Um, so we, we last summer, which was my first summer as mayor, we actually, you know, I mean, and, and this is a tough issue because there's some people that's like, get those kids off the corner from selling water, lock them up. Some folks are that, you know, that that far on that end, like if they keep selling water because they're, they're some of them are overly aggressive. They're jumping on your car. They're taking your cash app. They're taking your phone. I mean, that they, they went a little far over the pandemic. So we reined that in and said, hey, young man, young woman, you have an entrepreneurial spirit. You're selling water. You're buying it for X and you're selling for three times X. That's hey, that's the American way. You just don't have a business license and you're standing on a, on a public right of way and you're dodging cars, which is dangerous. And the car people, people, the, the motorists are afraid. So we've been saying to them and taking them and placing them in entrepreneurship programs with uh, small businesses that print T-shirts. Or they make fancy jeans or they sell, you know, they make hats and beanies and uh, or, or they sell. Well, then we also put some in a program called, hey, helping empower youth. And we gave them kiosks to sell the water out of on um, major like on Peach Street. Literally, young men and women are working out of a kiosk about the size of, you know, uh, I, I, would, I would probably say like. 20 by 20, like a large tent, but it's enclosed and they can sell water. They can sell Coca-Cola's. They can sell um, Atlanta gear. And they had to get up in the morning, go there, open up the kiosk, close it down, count the money. And that was like great last summer. We're doing it again this summer because we just can't have them on a the public right of way selling water because they could get hurt and it's uh, dangerous in other ways. And so uh, we, we're doing that and we'd like to do that times 10. That's actually really amazing. Um, I'm actually so sad that we're out of time though. Um, thank you again for coming to speak and you know stopping by. I heard you will also be at Disrupt this September. Uh, are you allowed to give us a peek of what you're gonna be doing? Um, no, you just have to wait and see. Um, we, but we're gonna enjoy it in September. You all have to definitely check us out at Disrupt. It's gonna be phenomenal. My team will be there. And we really, you know, always wanna highlight what Atlanta has to offer in this uh, entrepreneurial space and the tech ecosystem. And really just being one of the coolest cities in the world. Yes, oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Uh, well, thank you again for coming and thank you everyone for watching and listening. And please stay on because we have an exciting lineup and we have some panel fireside side chats and the pitch off competition coming soon. So sit right or sit tight um, as the event continues. Hey, Rodney, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, Dom, it's so good to see you. Um, I'm so excited to dive into this conversation, but before we do that, for those who are watching virtually, um, who might be unfamiliar with your work, can you please just briefly introduce yourself and what you do? Absolutely. Um, I also don't want let this to pass. Congratulations on one on your one year anniversary. Oh yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So um, just to give a little context, I have been in the technology startup and venture ecosystem um, approaching, oh my God, 25 years. I got my start um, back in 2000 formally um, with the inception of multicast media technologies. We were uh, pioneering developers of linear um, streaming technologies. Um, actually, in that day, they didn't really call it streaming. It was still called IPTV or multicasting, which was a construct created actually by Mark Cuban with his inception of broadcast.com. And so started my career off as a startup founder in the internet streaming space. Uh, that 
company was acquired in 2010. I released uh, my fourth book, Kingonomics, 12 Innovative Currencies for Transforming Your Business and Life, inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King in January of 2013. And in June of 2013, OHUB was born. My wife and I co-founded OHUB as a platform to ensure that everyone everywhere has equitable access to the technology startup and venture ecosystem as a path to creating new multi-generational wealth with no reliance on pre-existing multi-generational wealth. And so we are fastly approaching our 10-year anniversary um, as well. I do a few other things, general partner of a small uh, venture fund, 100 Black Angels and Allies. I'm actually a fund manager for the states of North Carolina and Alabama for their venture capital programs. I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution as well. So you've been, you're born and raised in Atlanta. Um, yep. And you went away briefly for college, but then you came back and started building and you've been investing in it long before, you know, it was, you know, what it is today. What potential did you see in the city that made you want to come back? Well, the, the potential one as an Atlanta native and my wife being an Atlanta native as well after my undergraduate work, and then I attended Penn State University College of Medicine, um, decided not to pursue that career pathway. And so really in coming back to Atlanta, it wasn't that there was a thriving technology ecosystem. Uh, it was really pulling on Atlanta's past history of empowering Black entrepreneurialism, even going back to um, our first Black mayor, Maynard Jackson, who, when negotiating a deal with Delta Airlines to relocate from Macon, Georgia, after they left Birmingham to come to Atlanta, Georgia, um, he negotiated for more than 35% of the airport contracts and vendor awards to go to qualified minorities and women. And that really shifted the trajectory of Atlanta as a place that you could build a company. Um, and so that was really a part of the reason for coming uh, back home um, and starting starting from, you know, from there, along with just the density of talent that exists in Atlanta, when you talk about Spelman College and Morehouse College, Clark Atlanta University, Morris Brown College, of course, there's also Emory and Georgia Tech. There's a density of technology talent, but there's also this entrepreneurial spirit that really exists at the intersection of innovation and culture and, and capital that you know, really became the thesis of OHUB um, as well. So it's kind of built on the thesis of Atlanta. And so that's one of the reasons, you know, why we decided to, to come back home and build in Atlanta. What changes have you seen over the years in Atlanta regarding how Black entrepreneurs are treated and how does that compare to the picture nationwide? You know, ab absolutely. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a data person, you know, particularly given the work I've done at Keenan Flagler, UNC, but also at um, Morehouse as, as well. And so, you know, when I think about um, Atlanta, I think I see two Atlantas. When you think about Atlanta in terms of small and medium-sized enterprises and Black ownership of those enterprises, We've done an incredible job of positioning those enterprises um, whereby they can um, do business with Atlanta's major enterprises, our Fortune 100 companies, to be specific. When you juxtapose that to our startup community, it also, um, it also points out the gaps in terms of where 
we think we are and where we should be when you compare it to where our SMEs are. And to be frank, I think Atlanta, uh, my native home, has incredible potential. Potential. But when I look at our startup ecosystem in particular, we're doing some great work, Dom, but I also think there's a lot to be desired. I've often made this comparison that, you know, our small and medium enterprise ecosystem is in, um, you know, the future of what it looks like to have more equitable opportunities, but our startup ecosystem seems like it is in what they call Sam Macell's um, Atlanta. Sam Macell was the mayor before Maynard Jackson became mayor. So we've also had some, what I consider to be outlier successes with fundraising, with the development of tech programs and tech hubs and hiring initiatives, but it's really, really time for us to double click and scale those beyond the performative. So I'm excited about the possibilities of Atlanta, but there's some critical work that has to be done that is more substantive with depth and with range um, as it relates to us really continuing to be that leader as it relates to being a black tech hub or black tech mecca as we call it. And of course, part of you know getting more opportunities for um, you know, black entrepreneurs in the ecosystem is all about, of course, playing that somewhat venture game. And so um, I'm really interested to know, what have you learned about the relationship between the black community and the way power moves that you didn't realize before you entered the tech, um, the venture tech ecosystem in Atlanta? Um, that's an incredible, incredible, you know, question uh, very incredible question so when when you look at how power was negotiated going back to when Maynard Jackson became um, the first black mayor there seemed to be like this 50 year pact or covenant that black Atlanta would lead the political um, constructs but white Atlanta would continue to drive the capital markets. Um, and so there was sort of this negotiation um, that happened whereby we saw black economic gains through black political power. Um, for us to experience that in you know, a fourth industrial revolution that's being driven by artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, you know, blockchain, you name it, all of these edge technologies that are being brought to market by companies being fueled by venture capitalists. When you think about that capital formation, um, we've got some work to do to make sure that the black power structure, which really stands for a diverse, equitable, and inclusive platform for all Atlantans um, to actually participate in this experiment that was envisioned um, by black political leadership going back 50 years. And so it's now time to transition that same level of thoughtfulness and planning and strategy to our startup ecosystem, particularly as it relates to um, the capital stack that is available for early stage founders. And I'll give you a case in point. Um, even in Atlanta today, if you're closing a pre-seed and or a seed round, rarely do you see the entire round being closed by investors in Atlanta. There are a couple outliers where we have seen this happen. But usually there may be a lead investor coming from sort of the, you know, the group of investors that are in town. And then those founders are hopping planes or now hopping on Zoom calls, talking to investors on the West Coast, you know, New York, Seattle, and just across the, the country, if that makes sense. Now, what I'm hopeful of is that um, there's a federal opportunity there by a state opportunity for the state small business credit initiative ssbci which was 
reauthorized Dom by the Biden administration. It was an Obama initiative, $10 billion to states to fund small businesses. It was reauthorized as a part of the American Recovery Plan Act, which was a response to the coronavirus. $10 billion goes to the states, and a lot of the states, including Georgia, um, have an allocation towards venture capital. And I believe there are talks about actually a carve out specifically for what the government is called, calling socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. So if the state of Georgia gets this right, we're going to see more capital, um, early stage capital going into the ecosystems that are demonstrating a density of high growth company building. So that's going to be, of course, Atlanta, uh, greater Atlanta, but also Atlanta proper. It's also going to be Savannah, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia um, as well. Those are centers of innovation density. Um, Athens, where the University of Georgia is as well, is now also doing, doing more as well. So to summarize all of that, I know I said a lot, but to summarize all of that, being a native of Atlanta, I watched how our Black policymakers were able to create economic opportunity that created more millionaires and created thousands of upperly mobile jobs through supplier diversity negotiations, through community benefits agreements negotiations, and also um, through government contracting opportunities. That same strategy must be applied to the startup ecosystem. And therein lies the opportunity because I think we've just uh, we've just really started to have those type of conversations. And I want to talk um, a little bit about you and your work with um, OHUB, because you mentioned that you wanted to forge a path for people to create multi-generational wealth without, without reliance on pre-existing generational wealth. And so I wanted you to kind of go deeper into that. Like, what does that mean and how, based on the ways in which, you know, the economic and social systems work in this country, uh, how do you like prep a historical outsider with the tools to like be an insider? Absolutely. So, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about how we've been doing it for the last 10 years. And I'll start with telling you how we plan to do it for the next 10 years. So um, in beta, we have the OHUB app. This is probably the first time I'm publicly mentioning it, where we are in the process of taking 10 years of subject matter expert content and basically putting that content in the app hosted by uh, a company we, uh, my wife and I reacquired at the end of 2021 called Pixel Tech. And so we're using that as our back end to basically put um, that information in the app. We developed a framework with the Federal Reserve and we signaled it through the Brookings Institution that basically lays out how um, to build an inclusive ecosystem from the ground up. And so that's really the playbook of Opportunity Hub. So this app really starts at the early exposure level, exposing people to um, the opportunities for work, for career pathways, for upskilling, but also um, the science of high growth company building. We teach company building as a science and a practice. And then also the connectivity that's required to connect to startup um, investors as well. Now, at a broad sense, when you think about OHUB, you think about it in terms of the placemaking work we've done in Atlanta, in Kansas City, in Austin, Texas, with South by Southwest and Houston Tillerson, and also now in New Orleans, Louisiana. So there's placemaking stacked with programs and now stacked with products. Let me give you some data. Over the last 10 years, Dom, OHUB has helped over 1,700 black and brown college students and adults get exposed to the ecosystem, get upskilled in the ecosystem, either through our immersive programs like HBCU at South by Southwest or our coding boot camps or technical sales or cybersecurity boot camps and secure their first job um, with an average salary of $90,000. That has been a path out of poverty for a lot of black and brown people that have gone through OHUP's programming over the last decade. In addition, 
on the high growth company building side, we have pre-accelerated or incubated nearly 500 companies through our high growth company building programming. We're now expanding on that as well with some federal contracts and awards. And then on the capital formation side, we've seen our founders go on to raise millions of dollars for um, their seed rounds or even some for their Series A rounds. We also took it a step further with the 100 Black Angels and Allies Fund we partnered with the Lynx Incorporated, the University of North Carolina, Keenan Flagler Business School, Duke University, and Stanford to create the Black Technology Ecosystem Investment Certificate. So we are teaching Black people and allies how to invest in the Black tech startup and venture ecosystem as an emerging asset class. I have the opportunity to signal this in a congressional um, testimony in front of the Financial Services Committee a couple of months ago, where they're looking at having these type of certificate programs count towards um, an American being considered an accredited investor. And so, you know, three lanes that we don't deviate from. There's the upskilling to career pathways as the high growth company building startup support programming and the capital formation as well. And um, I kind of want to talk to you about HBCUs a little bit because you mentioned it. How would you like to see them become more involved within the venture ecosystem? Um, that's an incredible question. You know, I didn't attend an HBCU. I was headed to Morehouse all my life. And I visited Tulane on a weekend, and that's what helped me make my decision um, to go to New Orleans, Louisiana, for my undergraduate studies. My wife, however, is a, however, is a graduate of Howard University. And so through our business and our foundation and our investment work, we have been intentional about partnering with our historically Black colleges and universities. Um, my advice to the leadership of HBCUs is to partner with the ecosystem builders that are already doing this work and together form a coalition to go after corporate philanthropic or even federal government funding or state funding that is specific to innovation. There are a lot of opportunities in the pipe um, you have the Chips and Science Act, which now regional tech hubs was just announced, managed by the Economic Development um, Administration. Alejandra Castilla um, is the deputy undersecretary there. You have the National Science Foundation. They have NSF engines. You have the Build Back Better Coalition um, as well. You have infrastructure, broadband. There's so much funding under the thesis dom of inclusive innovation. And rather than HBCU simply going along um, to get along, they should partner with ecosystem development organizations like Opportunity Hub and the dozens of organizations that exist nationwide. So they can create programs like we created at South by Southwest. They can create their own coding schools to then train thousands of engineers in their region. They can create technical sales schools. They can create technology incubators and accelerators. And there's also case examples of HBCUs as limited partners in venture funds. And so that is one of the ways to increase their endowment, but also create a pathway for their students into high growth companies where they can negotiate salary and equity for the future. So OHUB is committed to continuing you know, our work to partner with our nation's historically black colleges and universities. And we encourage other organizations to do the same. And we're, somewhat running out of time, but something I've always found interesting is that it seems overall, as the Black community talks about, you know, entrepreneurship and technology, um, on a mainstream scale at least, there's always an element, it seems, of culture or media that's sometimes intertwined with it. And so I wanted to ask you, like, why is that? And how important is that um, when it comes to teaching the next generation about the importance of, you know, entrepreneurship and generational wealth? Absolutely. I think media has an you know, has its place and plays an incredible role in terms of signaling the successes of founders, 
or ecosystem builders or even investors along the journey. And um, I've appreciated the work um, and the seriousness in which you approach your work in particular um, in really communicating the facts and doing your research as it relates to the signals that you make. Um, I also think balance is the key that you don't have to have a big brand and a lot of social media followers to build a multi-million dollar company that would be attractive to investors or customers or for people to work at. And so I wanna caution founders not to think that you have to become this big brand before you can build a big business. I come from an era where we built and sold a company without social media profiles, right? And so I'm always focused not so much on what's being said, I'm also looking and listening for what's not being said as well. And so I think as you continue to amplify your work, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you wanna be careful um, to amplify those things that are critical to the success of the business. At the end of the day, a business does not win simply by raising capital. A business wins by deploying the capital that it has raised um, into solutions that build the best products that are solving incredibly hard problems and are then attracting customers so that they can monetize the product um, inside of that respective business. I look forward to the days where we see interviews and conversations about companies approaching one, two, five, 10, 50 million dollars in revenue versus only one, 10, you know, 25, 50 million in funding. And um, I kind of wanted to bring it back to uh, a point kind of or the conversation earlier um, in terms of, you know, the inequities that are currently still here and that we're working to maneuver. Um, how far do you think minorities can go within venture without fair and equal backing from big firms and limited partners? You know, I don't think we're going to go that far without creating a new investor class. It's time for us to really stop chasing the current institutional and individual investors in either our venture funds, our syndicates, or our companies. Talk to them, put the deal out there, keep it moving. I think as an ecosystem and also as a Black community, it's really time to develop a new investor class, a new LP class that has a different investment thesis and a different conviction and lens for investing in Black founders. We can't keep expecting the same things from the same people and the same institutions. We saw a glimmer of hope in 2020. I was incredibly cautious about that, Dom. I think we did make some gains, but you know, you recently reported out on the data, looks like we're doing um, less than we were prior to 2020. So I think it's really time for us to reset and look at how do we create a new generation of limited partners um, that will invest in our funds and our companies. And then we also need to look at the power of the Jobs Act and equity crowdfunding and the role it can play as it relates to leveraging our affinity groups, whether that be the Lynx, Jack and Jill, the Divine Nine, our HBCUs, our church associations and other business associations as well. I was actually gonna kind of bring up 2020 because it's been a little over three years since the murder of George Floyd, since, you know, 2020, who hasn't kept their promise? Um, you know, um, I was chatting earlier with the founder of TP Insights, excited about what she's about to do next, Sherelle Dorsey. And she had a pretty comprehensive um, document and data set around who made commitments. I know there were some follow-up articles written, I'm not sure on what platform in particular, but it looked like that the majority of the multi-billion dollar commitments had not been met. And so I'm not, you know, personally, I'm not waiting on it. I thought it was a lot of performantism. 
let me give you a stat. So in 2020 and 2021, I worked with Brookings Institution to signal, um, to write and signal a report on how much would it cost to reach parity towards equity, right? We really got to understand these term terminology when we're talking about economic equality versus economic parity and then economic economic equity, parity, equality, or equality, parity, and equity. To reach parity and a path towards equity, we're looking at 23 to $26 billion annually to close that gap, whether it's the upskilling to career pathways gap. We noticed that was about a $50 billion gap of the amount of Black people that should be in tech but aren't in tech because of the discriminatory practices that exist. That's a trillion dollars lost um, in income over 20 year period, a generation. We can close that with that level of investment. So when people are hearing like, you know, a hundred million, like it sounds big, Dom, 150 million sounds big. But when you actually count the cost of what it will take to get us to equal equality and to parity and to equity, we're talking tens of billions of dollars a year for the next 50 years. And so we've got some work to do. I'm committed to doing the small part that we can do. And I'm excited about the others that are also on this journey as well. And this seems like a good note to end it. But before, before I do that, my final question, what okay. happens now? What's next? Well, um, you know, I just turned 50 in December of 2022. We are approaching the 10 year anniversary of Opportunity Hub. We have a vision to expand OHUB to 100 cities over the next 10 years in some iteration. On the capital formation side, I'm incredibly excited about the work we're doing in North Carolina. Um, and now I'm excited to announce um, we're working with Alabama as well. So a total combined of about $75 million to invest in socially and economically disadvantaged um, individuals. They call it SETI, um, fund managers and founders in those two states. Um, and so there's just a lot to do, but that's what OHUB is doing. I'm excited about our new energy technology incubator in New Orleans, Louisiana. Look out for that announcement soon because we're going to be investing $500,000 a year in five founders um, over the next four years. And we're also, Dom, are just applying for a lot of federal funding that's being made possible uh, by the Biden-Harris administration. And that is all we have time for today. So thank you, Rodney, for coming. And thank you, everyone who came to listen virtually. Stay tuned for the rest of the event and what Total ATL Live has to offer. And of course, the pitch competition coming soon. And yeah, have a good rest of the day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to TechCrunch's Spotlight on Atlanta. We've got a great investor panel here today. I'm joined by Sean O'Brien, who works with Overline Ventures, and I'm also joined by Shyla Neves Burney, who's with us from Zane Venture Fund. We have a great panel today for you guys, and I think a great place to get started is why don't you guys both describe to me what is so interesting about investing in Atlanta right now? Shyla, you want to kick us off? Sure. So what I think is um, incredible about just Atlanta as a whole, right? Um, we have so many different things here, not only our universities, not only um, the, the culture, um, the diversity. Um, I just think that we are set up for success in so many different ways, right? And so for me, um, who, who kind of goes in early in deals like at the pre-seed level and, and seed, I'm just excited about the opportunities that I continue to see here. People either moving here or people who are here um, building companies. For us, it's primarily we're interested in tech companies. And so there's just no limit for the talent. Um, and so it's always exciting to see the talent that's coming out of the Atlanta uh, university systems. Um, and so for me, um, that's what I find exciting, just the talent. Yeah, I would I would second that. Uh, we, you know, as pre-seed and seed investors, uh, my partner and I, um, my partner Michael and I, 
Uh, we screen first on founding team, and I agree with Shyla completely. They're, the talent that's here uh, built in in the Atlanta ecosystem is second to none. Uh, we've got lots of universities and colleges uh, that are cranking out you know, top tier talent, not only in technology, uh, but in deep tech and in consumer related um, uh, businesses as well. So talent, uh, we've got a friendly ecosystem full of funding uh, sources as well as other support sources uh, for founders who are building our community. We've got a mayor who's very pro-business and pro-technology uh, and a, you know, a, a set of business laws that make it a great place to build and grow a business. Um, and we just have a different way of doing things down here in Atlanta. Everybody here is friendly, uh, collaborative. There's not a lot of sharp elbows in the city. Um, and there's a lot of resources that come together to support founders on the earliest stages all the way through uh, their growth stages of their companies. So it's a great uh, city to build in and a great moment in time for our city. Mm -hmm. And knowing that you both talked a lot about talent, that's definitely something I've heard time and time again about the Atlanta ecosystem is just how strong and diverse the talent base there is. And sort of looking at the types of companies that are getting built or the types of companies you guys are both interested in, are there any sectors or hidden gems that you find in Atlanta that it seems like Atlanta entrepreneurs are particularly good at? Um, I'm going to say uh, B2B SaaS. Um, my, my venture partner has made a lot of deals in that sector, and those deals tend to do well here in the South. Um, and so we kind of leaned into that. We found a few SaaS companies that we've invested in. Um, and so for, for, I think that's one of the critical ones. But, you know, as Sean said, like deep tech is coming. We have a biomedical, it's called, what is it, Georgia Tech Square or Science Square. <clears throat> so there's biotech that's here now. Um, it's not an industry that, that we invest in, but it is here, right? There are funds that have been set up for that particular. Um, I don't. Um, in terms of other sectors, fintech was huge at one point. I'm not sure if it is right now here in the Southeast. Sean may know differently. Um, not for the, from some of the companies I've looked at. Folks have kind of moved away or pivoted away from some of the fintech. That was the payments, I guess, back in like 2020, 2021, when companies like Stripe were coming out and all of these competitors came out. I don't see a lot of that now, um, but for me, I play, try to pay close attention to enterprise SaaS because those are the companies I'm looking for um, and that have been tended to scale in the past. Yeah, I, I think um, B2B SaaS clearly um, has been a winner for our community. Uh, I would say that fintech, we still see a lot of promising fintechs at a lot, of, you know, at all stages. We've got some in our portfolio and then looking around the community, there's some breakouts like Greenlight Financial, um, that are continuing to truck along. Um, we've recently been known for Web3, uh, which I know is not really a vogue uh, spot uh, to be investing in the market currently, uh, but we've got a great uh, community there. We've got a long history of MarTech and sales technology building in uh, the city. Uh, we're really excited about some of the newer industries like AI. There's a lot of really cool things happening right here in our community in AI. And then clearly we are without a doubt a leader in logistics and supply chain, um, you know, taking advantage of some of our big fortune 100 companies like UPS, obviously Home Depot and others that have big uh, supply chain and logistics, um, you know, backgrounds. Uh, you know, we've got a number of notable breakouts uh, here in the community and a lot of early stage startups that are building to solve some of those critical you know, uh, opportunities that many of which were highlighted during some of the supply chain issues of COVID. So one of the things that we really love is the diversity of not only talent here, but the diversity of types of businesses that are being built right here in the community. Mm -hmm. And knowing that you just mentioned that the city has some of those big corporations, those Fortune 500 and 100 companies based there, that is definitely an asset for the city compared to, say, some other locations that just don't have that sort of density of those big corporate players. And how do you think that is a strength for the Atlanta ecosystem, for these startups building somewhere where there are these large companies right in their backyard? It's huge. Um, it, I'll just jump in on that one. Uh, we've got some notable large companies that have been very direct um, in their support of fostering um, you know, entrepreneurship and innovation in our city. Uh, we've got, I think, 13 now corporate partners that are supporting the Engage program, uh, which is deliberately trying to match uh, corporate buyers with 
uh, innovation in the form of startups. Uh, so that's one tangible example. We've got other um, companies, large companies like Cox Enterprises, which is a $20 billion private company that has been a, you know, contributor in many key ways to the local startup ecosystem through funding programs like Engage, programs like Techstars Atlanta and Techstars Social Impact, uh, but always being there with the spirit of helping out, um, you know, under the mantra that if it's good for Atlanta, it's good for Cox. Uh, but the most, you know, notable way they can help is by embracing uh, early stage innovation in the form of becoming a customer you know, the best, um, you know, funding for uh, many companies is customer funding. And so we've got that spirit of adopting early, uh, which is key. We've also got the spirit of, you know, the executives and the leadership teams of these large companies have shown an interest in leaning and supporting founders that are building through mentorship, through formal advisory work and the like. Um, and then just being an active contributor to getting this flywheel cranking that we're all trying to accelerate here to create sort of this launching pad for the next generation of founders is something that I think our, our large corporate partners are really keenly interested in doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we totally agree. We've, um, we work with a few of them like Southern Company who's looking for some of the, the, the um, talent to become part of their, you know, uh, diverse, uh, what are they, diverse suppliers. And so we've tried to get some of our portfolio companies into corporations for that reason. Just Sean's point about like getting these corporations as a customer more than anything I think is critical versus looking at them as a potential investor. Um, and so we tried to take that strategy with some of the, our portfolio companies um, who are enterprise um, technology companies. And so I totally agree, um, Engage is, sort of like the house for all of these particular corporates there's I think there's a graduation tomorrow something tomorrow um, when we'll get a look at some of the companies that have come out of engage and this is where the corporate partners play a, a, a really strong role um, in some of these early stage companies definitely definitely and knowing that since you both do invest at the early stages I was going to ask you about sort of what the late stage funding environment looks like in Atlanta and kind of what are the strengths there and maybe what are some of the holes that it would be better for the ecosystem to get someone to fill? I'm going to let Sean go there because I, I am I pay particular attention to where I promised my LPs I was going to pay and that's in the early stage. And so Sean may have some, um, even though I know a lot of the late stage, I don't know what's happening um, with late stage companies. Yeah, you know, we are also focused uh, primarily on pre-seed and seed investing. Um, but part of our job as, you know, a good uh, venture partner for our portfolio companies is being deliberate about maintaining relationships with downstream investors. And so while we will write checks in the later stages through our opportunity fund, we really spend an awful lot of time, um, you know, collaborating with some of the downstream investors. Many of them are in the coastal cities uh, where you'd expect in Boston and New York and San Francisco, but we've got some great, you know, series B and beyond investors here in Atlanta. I would say that when Michael and I started Overline, we thought that the most acute need in the funding ecosystem was at the earliest stages, at formation stage, you know, two founders and an idea concept on a whiteboard that they want to turn into code and turn into product and turn it ultimately into a company. And so that's where we started. Um, and we've been, you know, trying to drive, you know, collaboration to make sure that as we get past the point where Overline is really built to be a hands-on kind of early stage partner in the zero to one stage of a business that we have a really safe and comfortable place to, to hand them off to. Um, and so I think, but in general, I think we could use more capital at all stages here in Atlanta. While we've come a really long way as an ecosystem over the last 10 years, we still have work to do. And that's one of the areas where I think we could um, continue to improve. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I was going to follow up on that about sort of how do you lure these deep pocketed investors, as you mentioned, who maybe are coastal or just not based in the city to Atlanta. And once they're here, how do you guys thinking about how the ecosystem can make sure that they're here to stay once they do arrive? So I'll just tell you how I work with um, some of the, mainly the West Coast investors who are looking for talent here in Atlanta um, and wanting some, most of them are looking at it because of the companies that we've already invested in. And so they have, have an interest in our portfolio. And so for us, you know, it, it is, you know, 
I, developing that relationship, like Sean said, because we, after us, we know there's someone else who needs to pick it up when we start to, to leave off for us, it's around Series A. And so for me, I've been really cognizant of making relationships, bringing them to town, right? So we've had True Ventures out, of, out of, on the West Coast who has come to town, wanted to meet women founders here in Atlanta. So you have a dinner or whatever, but that's a one-off. My, my goal is like, when are you going to come? When's the next one? What's the follow-up for the um, portfolio companies? That sort of thing. So keeping that line of communication open, open. So hopefully they will set up a presence here. There is a, I don't know, $4 billion fund that I talked to five years ago. I have no idea why, but they reached back out to me because now they have, they have a presence here in Atlanta. I think there was one person and then someone comes back and forth. So I'm trying to be, like Sean said, there's no no rough elbows here. We want to be friendly and open and say, hey, we're open for business. Yes, take a look at our portfolio companies. Sure, I'm happy to, you know, curate a dinner for you to kind of see what's happening in the ecosystem. And so it's just being open to, you know, meeting with them and talking with them and hearing about what they think about Atlanta and how we can help them, you know, make some decisions to have a presence here and be ready for when our companies are looking for that type of um, financing. And so, um, yeah, it is just about having that relationship with them and yeah. we've just done it in unconventional ways. Go ahead, Sean. I know, I think, I think you're exactly right. I think the one thing that you keyed in on there is being present in the community. I think, you know, having the capital is one thing, but having somebody who's here, who's on the ground supporting, um, you know, founders in their journey, getting to know the local ecosystem is key. Uh, thrilled that we've seen some of the big funds uh, have uh, people here in town. We've got Insight, who's got an uh, you know, investor here, you know, Drive Capital just added somebody here with a specific mandate of Atlanta. Circano just added a person. We're hearing almost, you know, quarterly of a larger fund putting an outpost here in Atlanta, which is a start. I mentioned before, uh, Mayor Dinkins is doing a great job um, you know, supporting uh, the ecosystem. He named a tech czar, uh, tech advisor, Donnie Beamer, who's gone out um, and so, sort of carrying the Atlanta flag uh, to some of the coastal communities to try to um, show them all the great things that are happening in our ecosystem. But I think ultimately, and I should also mention Venture Atlanta is, you know, sort of a, an event and the innovation month that surrounds Venture Atlanta is a way for our city uh, and the broader community to spotlight all the amazing things that are happening here. And we're continuing to set records as far as the number of outside investors that are coming into the community uh, to see what's happening here. Ultimately, it's going to take winners. And the good news is we're starting to see an increased pace of winners. Obviously, we've had some notable breakouts um, like Sales Loft and Calendly. Uh, Lease Query is you know, there, Flock Safety, One Trust, uh, Greenlight Financial that I mentioned before. And I think ultimately, it's going to be important for these winners to break out so that founders realize that you can start and build a very large and important company right here in Atlanta, and that the funders will ultimately realize that what we've got here is special and that you can build a unicorn or a decacorn right here in the Atlanta ecosystem. So I think it's just going to take time and more winners. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. That was something I was going to get into as well, is this sort of Atlanta has had these big winners, as you mentioned, and there has been exits, and but it's not consistent. If you look at, say, the data from someone like PitchBook, it goes up and down. There's good quarters for exits, and then there's some quarters where there are no company exits at all. Right. And I'm curious how you think about the exit environment and how it sort of impacts the overall ecosystem, or if you think, like you mentioned, Sean, you guys are almost there. Like we're almost at that point where maybe we're going to start seeing a lot of exits that'll sort of allow things to click into place. But yeah, I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are on how maybe this inconsistent exit environment is impacting the market and maybe how, when that changes, it could have an effect. Yeah. You know, um, being able to time these kind of big notable exits is very, very difficult to do. Um, but I will tell you the one thing that hasn't slowed down is the number of people and organizations and capital that are intentionally leaning into the community to support these founders that are building here. So everything that's happening upstream has been a steady and consistent increase in pace and momentum. And you know the outcomes, which are the big celebrated exits, there's a lot of things that go into it right now, obviously COVID and 
Um, this macroeconomic environment has been challenging and has reset valuations across the board, which is sort of, you know, maybe caused some of the ones that were unicorns or on their way very quickly to become unicorns to take a step back. But I'm confident and, you know, that seeing everything that's happening from an organization and collaboration perspective around, you know, fostering Atlanta as a leading ecosystem for entrepreneurship and innovation, that it's absolutely inevitable that the pace and the number and the consistency of these large high profile exits will only continue. And so one of the things that, I, and I can't remember the investor that shared this with me, she's from Atlanta, but is on the West Coast, you know, talking about how the data is, is really skewed. <laughs> Um, and, and the fact that we don't tell a good story, right? So we, there's one data point that we were on par with Austin in terms of exits, but ours took longer to exit, right? The companies here in Atlanta just take longer, but we still have, you know, exits, I guess, similar to theirs. And so the thing is, I don't think Atlanta as a whole, we don't tell our story well enough. We don't talk about our wins. You know, we just get right back to work. And I think that's the thing with Donnie Beamer out of the mayor's office is, is attempting to do. How do we tell this, this awesome story that's happening down here? Um, we don't have as much capital as the West Coast, but we are still having an impact, right, in terms of exits, um, these young entrepreneurs building great companies. And so I think that's one of our biggest flaws is that we don't have, we have not been able to tell the Atlanta story. What's our secret sauce? Because there is one here. And so what I feel like um, there was even something that came out over the weekend and I was like, where does this data come from? It came from Carla, I believe, that said we had only made 64 deals. Like we were near the bottom in terms of deal made. But looking at the numbers, um, I think it was, who, I can't forget who was under us, Miami, I believe. Miami invested in more money, but we made more deals. And so that won't, that's not a story. No one is looking at that. We're actually putting money to work at a faster pace than Miami. We're just not writing the check sizes that Miami writes is writing and so i think it is our story that just needs to be told in a way and there's a community of us who are trying to figure that out there's startup atlanta here who wants to do that right bring everything under one umbrella so someone could really tell that story in such a magical way and i think that to me that's our issue um i don't think i mean we're doing on pace with a lot of other um hubs that are much bigger and broader broader than we are um and so i think we do good at the level we're at right and i think um i think we just need to be recognized that there is something here i mean there is something special and we've had our unicorns and you know no we've not had one um to break out but that's, that doesn't mean there's one on the way right that that is working hard right now and so i think just telling that story more succinctly um is something that we could do a much better job at Yes, Miami, that is something I have always found really interesting about the Atlanta ecosystem. And before we got onto this panel, I went and checked the Q1 numbers. And mm -hmm. I don't know, you said you may have gotten those numbers from Carta, but mm -hmm. looking at PitchBook, PitchBook has tracked that there was more money invested in uh, startups in Georgia and the Atlanta area in um, Q1 of this year compared to all of the state of Florida in Q1 of this year. And wow. obviously they have growing hubs in St. Petersburg and in Tampa as well. So I mm -hmm. thought that was really interesting. And so you you dug into that very well, Shiloh, but I'm Sean, I am curious about your thoughts about that as well. Sort of this weird notion that we're all talking about Miami, even though there are ecosystems like Atlanta that are maybe making more of a difference or maybe putting in, as you said, more of the work to kind of build an actual ecosystem. Yeah, um, you know, I think to, to Shala's point, narrative and storytelling is a big part of it. Miami has just been, I mean, Mayor Suarez has just done a incredible job of saying that Miami is open for business and basically um, accepting, you know, all of the incoming capital from San Francisco that basically essentially just drained out into that ecosystem. And it was magic to see. Um, and I think to, our, to a certain extent, that's what our current administration here in Atlanta is trying to replicate the good parts of that. Um, you know, these there's so many different data points out there. You know, PitchBook will put some stuff out, then Cardo will put some stuff out, and they slice and dice the by county, by region, by metro area. I think a lot of those data are skewed at times by some of these later stage mega rounds that are hundreds of millions of dollars in a single funding. 
um, that could account for many dozens of early stage investments that might be happening here in Atlanta that might get outshined, or at least the way the math is working on a non-volume weighted basis, might get outshined by one nuclear nuclear fusion deal or you know one you know extremely large biotech startup. And so um, again, I'll just make the point that the data is going to tell a story at a moment in time. And what we, from an ecosystem perspective, are really focused on is building a foundation that every step forward is a step forward in permanence, mm-hmm. and that we take the entire community with us. And that our starting point for the next generation is always farther along than where it was when we got here. And that's everybody who's who, who's in here and getting this flywheel going. And so we've been less caught up as a community in sort of the hype cycle stocks. Um, and so I think we're better positioned because we're building good businesses that are diverse, not only in talent, but in industry that are focused on building sustainable business, not just trying to get the highest valuation and the biggest round and the biggest headline and a quick exit, but they're talking about jobs and they're talking about sustainability uh, from a you know business perspective. And so I like our approach here in Atlanta, maybe a little slower on the start, but I think it's gonna build the right kind of business uh, ecosystem here for the long run. Mm-hmm. And sort of going off of that business fundamentals and sort of not going into the hype cycles, it's definitely easy to tell from the numbers as well that after going through the bull markets of 2020, 2021, and then the subsequent pullback kind of across the board in 2022, if you look at the numbers, there was a pullback in Atlanta, but not the same way there was a pullback in other markets, both established and emerging as well. And so I'm curious, what would you lend some of that, just that sustainability of the market? The market could just keep going still getting a lot of great numbers every quarter, still sort of backing these companies and being able to grow at a time when other markets are not seeing the same kind of success or the same kind of grit in their own ecosystems. Yeah, I mean, I think some other of the coastal cities, the more mature venture markets, um, you know, there's just been this um, mentality that's permeated with many founders that there's just this inexhaustible pile of money that's always going to be available. And I think one of the benefits, and I'm going to say this in the right way, one of the benefits of growing in a market like Atlanta where capital has been scarce, um, you know, the best businesses have always found funding, but it hasn't been, you know, sort of, one of the, you know, sort of as readily available. Um, And I think one of the benefits is the founders here have been focused, at least in the 20 years that I've been here in investing on building good solid businesses not just on the flashiest PowerPoints or the best elevator pitches, but ones that truly have unique differentiation that's sustainable over time, um, that you know they've got a unique insight into and building in a way where they're capital efficient relative to some of uh, the other cities that we've you know compare ourselves to. Um, and you know I think it everything regresses to a mean over time. I think you're going to start seeing the data showing that we're going back to a mean. Um, in some of these markets that got hyperinflated. And, you know, I just think our, our good fundamental blocking and tackling approach that at least the startups that we see here in the community is going to win in the long run. Shala, how about you? I 100% agree. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, Sig and I always we talked about is like, like, I don't get caught up in the hype of a deal, right? So I, there were a lot of hype deals that came our way and we said no. Um, because we are looking at a particular founder, a particular company, and hype isn't what we're looking for, right? Can you actually build this business? And so we said no to a lot. And, and, and I think that's what works here, right? And so now we said no to a lot. Now we're able to do follow on to some of our companies who, you know, maybe they've hit a rough, rough patch. We have capital to do follow on to part of our strategy, but we're putting it where the companies that need it the most. And it happens right now to be in our portfolio. And so we didn't get caught up in high valuations or anything like that. We stayed true to what we had promised again to our LPs. And I think that's what's causing us to have, you know, our companies are scaling up, right? They, they are all are trending up and we feel good about that. 
And so um, I think that's going to help us be the differ differentiator out of all of these other hubs. And it and it's probably it's t time to tell, but we, we see it in real time here. Um, but I think we because of that, um, being, I hate to say ca cautiously optimistic with our capital, but, you know, I think we don't just, we're not following the trends, right? Um, we want to set them and, and, and then focus on the companies that are building them and um, have our access in that way. And so I think that's what served us well so far as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And definitely thinking about sort of where the ecosystem heads from here. Obviously we won't be in this bear market forever. What would you guys say is the biggest hurdle or roadblock for the ecosystem to grow from here? And on the same, on the flip side of that, what are you most excited about for the next five years in the Atlanta ecosystem? So if me, I, what I would think is the big, biggest hurdle, we don't have something for our talent, right? So whether it's giving them opportunity to build a company, right? We have to have an ecosystem to be able to do that. So providing them with the resources, the capital and everything else that makes for growing a good company. Um, I've talked to a lot of our talent that left Atlanta, right? And they went to LA, they went to Boston, somewhere on the West Coast. And I'm going, why? Well, they all felt like they didn't, at that time, they didn't have all the resources necessary to build a great company. And, and so I think it's incumbent upon us to really um, nurture that early talent. So for, here at Zane, that's why we, that we, we, we work with the universities because we want to help them have these students thinking about entrepreneurship, building a great company. Um, and then when they, when they finish school that they stay here and do that, right? And so that's what's important. That's what's been important for us. Like how do we nurture the ecosystem um, and keep the talent here so they don't leave and go to another ecosystem where they feel like it may be better and there's better opportunity. So I think creating opportunity for our talent is um, is where I wanna be focused. And I think we are focused as, a, as an ecosystem as well. Yeah, I, I think um, I think the biggest concern is just not resting on our laurels. Um, we make progress. I think at times in the past, maybe we'll push hard as a community, and we'll start getting some success, and people will start backing off. And we're in a, you know, in a, a season where we all just need to keep the momentum and keep the pace. And I think if we do that, things are going to continue to work out great for us as a community. I'll tell you what I'm most excited about is just the pace of innovation that we're already seeing and the creativity of ideas that we're seeing and diversity of ideas that we're seeing. And in particular, now that we've had some big um, companies grown and some really big and notable exits, we're starting to see the second generation founders coming out of some of the recent successes. Probably not mention any names, but there's been some notable exits here in town. And we're starting to see the ones who were really close, um, but you know, maybe didn't, um, you weren't the number one or number two uh, people uh, in those startups, but they were close and early and they saw what great looks like and saw what is possible and they're coming out. And so sort of everybody talks about the PayPal mafia and what they've gone on to. We're starting to get those mafias here in multiples. And that's when we really like to engage is two people with a concept that they built a solution around at their company. And now they want to build a business around it. Perfect. And that's what I'm most excited about the pace of that, that we're seeing here. Definitely. Definitely. And knowing we're right up against time, I just wanted to take another second to thank you both for coming on today. This has been really fun. And I feel like I learned a lot about an ecosystem that I thought I knew a lot about, but maybe I did not. So thank you very much, Sean and Shyla, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it.
Man, this has been great. Uh, I, I really do love Atlanta, and I wish we could be there in person. But these virtual events are great for us because we get to reach a lot of people at the same time. But we do have one more event coming up. So this last segment for the City Spotlights Atlanta is a pitch off. We have three amazing startups presenting to two judges. We have Jewel Burke Solomon. She's the managing partner at Colab Capital and Basant Kamath, general partner at Tech Squared Ventures. Now, these two venture capitalists are going to be evaluating our startups based on the potential for impact. That can be a social impact, can be a financial impact. We're just looking for a company that has the potential to make a big splash. So we have three companies, and the first one coming up, I'd like you to introduce them to the stage, Edgar Gray for Falcom. Edgar, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, uh, of course. Now, before we get started, I want to know where in the Atlanta area you're located. We are right in Colony Square, which is uh, Midtown. Okay, Centrally great. located in the Midtown area. What's your favorite place to go to lunch around there? Oh, I've tried so many different places. <laughs> they have really good food in Atlanta, so uh, we're pretty spoiled. Uh, so it's great. <laughs> that's, that's great. All right, Edgar. Well, let, let's see, Falcom. You have five minutes to present your company with the pitch deck starting now. All right. Well, thanks again. Uh, my name is Edgar Garay, and I'm the CEO and founder of Falcom. And we're a fabless semiconductor startup developing the next generation of ultra-efficient semiconductor products for the wireless communication market. Uh, next slide. So a critical component in wireless data transmission is the power amplifier, or PA for short. Uh, this is a critical component, and it was developed around 100 years ago. Uh, and the problem with the PAs currently is that they're very energy inefficient. And this is creating a lot of uh, challenges in thermal management and also in the energy budget of a lot of the wireless infrastructure and a lot of our wireless devices. And we haven't seen a major breakthrough in innovation in the last 30 years. We have only seen incremental improvements. And whether you're aware or not, you probably own around 50 power amplifiers in all your wireless devices and, and, and devices that you use every day to connect to the network. Uh, this 90-year-old technology right now is the industry standard and is creating a bottleneck in the development of wireless network infrastructure and devices. Uh, next slide, please. So now if you go back for the past 20, 30 years and you plot the energy efficiency of the state-of-the-art PAs, uh, you'll see that there is a clear limit, uh, physical limitation, uh, which is constrained uh, by the electronic devices, components, and also a lot of the architectures that we use in modern devices. And we have only seen incremental improvements that have been obtained through better fabrication processes. Next slide. So these are a few examples of the major problems that the wireless industry is facing due to the energy inefficient found in PAs. Uh, last year alone, the electricity bill for cellular base station was more than $120 billion. And if you calculate the entire electricity bill for all the wireless network infrastructure, it's around 2% of the entire uh, world consumption. Uh, so inefficient PAs also result in satellite manufacturers having to pay more in launching costs due to the additional batteries and solar panels that are required in the satellites, and also in, in uh, handheld devices, cell phones, and all everyday devices that we use, uh, PAs use a large portion of the battery, uh, which is form factor limited. Uh, so what's more important is that today, 22% of your cell phone's carbon emissions come from the wireless infrastructure alone, and mainly uh, from the PA. Next slide. So we spent almost a decade at Georgia Tech reinventing the, the way power amplification is done, and we created a new type of device uh, that we're calling the dual drive PA. Uh, so the result is a very tiny chip that can be fabricated using any commercial semiconductor process has the energy highest the, the highest energy efficiency that any other commercial available PA in the market. And this is just the beginning for our silicon proven technology. Next slide. As part of our technology, we have developed multiple uh, uh, demonstrations of this technology at different frequencies and for different markets. And in this slide, we're showing the different chips that we have developed. Uh, we're reaching efficiencies close to 60% at 28 gigahertz. So that means great efficiencies for 5G millimeter wave applications and also at higher frequencies for future uh, uh, wireless network gen uh, generations. Next slide, please. So we're extremely confident that we can uh, make this a commercial success. And uh, based on our pipeline, 
we believe that we're going to reach $2 million in, re in revenue by next year, uh, which includes sub-licensing our technology and also NRE contracts and joint development contracts with uh, tier one semiconductor manufacturers. And our goal is for us to move forward is to have our dual drive technology in a commercial product by next year. Next slide. So power amplifiers is a great market with a time of $60 million and it's growing at an extremely fast data rate due to the deployment of the satellite infrastructure and 5G infrastructure. And our goal is to go to the all, all the satellite market, which includes SATCOM, radar, Wi-Fi, and emerging markets. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, we're a Georgia Tech spin-off and our core team has deep, deep expertise in silicon-based electronics. And we're also the inventors of the technology as well. And we're joined by industry veterans to know how to get to market quickly. Next slide. So currently we're raising $4 million. Uh, we already have a million dollars in commitments. Uh, we have initial revenue, and this is gonna help us to go to market quickly. And I'm gonna leave you with some of the comments that we're receiving regarding our technology and some of the news article about our company. Uh, if you'd like to join us, make the world more energy efficiency, uh, feel free to reach uh, to me personally or contact us uh, through our email that I have listed here or our website as well. Thank you guys. Edgar, that was very good. Jewel, let's start with you. First, first couple of questions can come from you. Sure. Thanks so much, Edgar. Really exciting to hear about what you're working on. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that you have some revenue today and that you're projecting uh, $2 million by next year. Can you talk a little bit more about your go-to-market strategy? And also curious if government is at any part playing a role in your go-to-market? So right now, government is not playing a role. It will be in the future through defense contracts and SBIRs, uh, which uh, it's really kind of, it's perfect for the technology that we're developing or that we have developed. Uh, so the way we're uh, uh, looking at our revenue, increasing our revenue is through contracts. So we go to, uh, for example, satellite companies and we show them the technology and we kind of custom made power amplifiers and different chips for them. And that's how we're able to generate the initial revenue. And moving forward, the idea is to create semiconductor products, to have a library of semiconductor products. But right now, we're kind of bootstrapping through contracts. Great. And you talked about um, the fact that you've been working on this technology for 10 years, I think you said. Can you talk a little bit more about your team, how you came upon wanting to solve this problem in particular, and how you formed the team today? Yeah, for sure. So we, we're PhDs out of Georgia Tech. Uh, so uh, mo most of the technology was developed uh, uh, in the research labs at, at Georgia Tech. And uh, that's how we got the uh, group of people together. Uh, the first thing that we did to get the technology out of the lab, we supplied to an accelerator. So we moved to the uh, Berkeley area. We applied to something that's called the Berkeley Skydeck Accelerator Program. And it's your typical accelerator when they, you know, start up one on one. They give you a little bit of money and they help you kind of with your network and how to how to you know, hire, bring people to the team and all that. Uh, so that's the first thing that we did. And then we did a, a pre-seed round and we raised, you know, a, a little bit of money and we've been able to, you know, with that mature the technology and, and get people together. Awesome. Thanks. Basan? Thank you, Edgar. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining and pitching. So um, I wanted to ask about the the value proposition on energy efficiency. So, so maybe could you give a couple of examples of how much more energy efficient this is than the normal way of of manufacturing PAs? Uh, what what are mm -hmm. the examples or stats? Maybe how much? More yeah, for sure. Efficient? So, so, so right now we can claim that we're twice as energy efficient as any other commercial uh, product in the market. Uh, so that's the metric that that we use. Yeah. And have you have you tested that on any any beta customers or anybody um, from your research or anything like that? So we use the standard uh, testing procedures. Uh, so if you go to you know if you have a if you're building Wi-Fi, so if you're a company building Wi-Fi and you need a power amplifier, uh, you look at data sheets with standard uh, you know uh, uh, technical specifications. So we have uh, standard data sheets for the products that we have right now, and that's how we're able to compare. Uh, but we're uh, we're gonna go to San Diego next week, and we're gonna validate the technology with a third-party semiconductor company, uh, a, a big semiconductor company, 
so hopefully through that we can also demonstrate that it's not only us that may that you know tested and verified the devices, but you know third party validation it's it's super important, especially when the delta in terms of technology differentiation is so high, uh, because usually you don't see in semiconductor products that huge increase in performance. You usually see you know five, ten, twenty percent. So when we go to people and tell them we're twice as efficient. Uh, they want to see third-party validation. Uh, so next yeah. week, two weeks from now, we'll have that. Yeah. Great. Anything else? No. Yeah. All right. Well, I think there's only one major semiconductor company in San Diego, but I, we don't have to say the name Qualcomm. But, <laughs> but we can. Okay. Well, Edgar, thank you so much for presenting. I, I really appreciate it. And best of luck to you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have Nicole. Nicole Tool. Nicole is coming to us from EcoGo or ECGO. Nicole, are you there? Yes, and it is Eco. Eco. Yes. I love it. All right. Where are you guys based out of the Atlanta area? Um, I'm from Alpharetta, um, but our office is in Ponce City Market. Oh, great. Great. So what do you guys like to do for, for lunch around there? Lunch around there. There's this really good pasta spot and it is leaving my brain right now, but it is so good. It's in Ponce City Market. They've got the best carbonara. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nicole. Well, you have five minutes. I'm very excited to see this presentation. Floor is okay. all yours. All right. Can you recycle this? Next. Can you recycle? Next slide. Can you recycle this? Next slide. How about this? Next slide. The simple answer is yes. Next slide. With an asterisk. Next slide. You see, the recyclability of an item isn't determined by the numbers or symbol on your packaging. It's actually determined by your location. Recycling guidelines vary based on where you're located at that specific place and time. Next slide. For example, at Georgia Tech, you can recycle pizza boxes. Next slide. But at Georgia State, you can't. These little nuances in recycling is what makes it confusing and it's costing us both environmentally and economically. Next slide. 219 million tons of recyclable waste enters our landfills every year. We spend over $200 billion just to send it there. I spent the last five years in undergrad research, researching this problem, which ultimately led to the development of Eco. Next slide. Eco is a mobile app that uses artificial intelligence to detect the recyclability of materials meaning that you can take a picture of anything and Eco knows exactly where and how to recycle it based on your location. Next slide. As you recycle on our mobile application, you earn points that are redeemable for discounts for products and services within your community, like a cup of coffee or a trip to the movie theater. Next slide. Uh, today we're focusing specifically on university campuses because they have the closest product market fit. Universities have waste zero goals to reach by 2025 and 2030. And the main thing that's hindering them from reaching these goals is their contamination rates, AKA when people put the wrong things in the recycling bins. They're looking for tools to help better engage their students on what they should be placing in their bins so they can, that they can reach their zero waste goals. Next slide. Today we're focusing on the university campuses, but we also see applications of our technology in, in municipalities as well as corporate offices. And our overall goal is to take it to the general market um, where anyone with a B2C application that anyone can use will be able to service them correct recycling guidelines no matter where they might be located. Next slide. Our main competitors are Zabble and Scrap. And the main thing that separates us from our competitors is our technology and our go-to-market strategy. Scrap is an application that uses barcode detection to detect the recyclability materials, but it really limits what they're able to detect because not everything has a barcode. Zavel is an application that is mostly, mostly focused on the recycling coordinators, so they provide a suite of tools to help the recycling coordinator better manage the materials that are in their streams. Eco is an app that allows for the consumers to know exactly how to dispose their waste, and then we allow for the recycling coordinator to see how students, how employees, how residents are engaging with their programs so they can have better overall decision-making. Next slide. So we license our applications to these institutions um, and these, app, these contracts range between 50 and $125,000 a year. We also see applications to monetize the, data, the waste data that we collect. 
Um, so we've had conversations with Coke as well as Procter & Gamble. And we've learned that they're looking for solutions in order to track where and how their items are disposed across geographic locations. Because students are taking pictures of their items, we're able to provide these insights to them. Next slide. So, so far we've launched paid pilots at Georgia State and Georgia Institute of Technology. In the last five months, students dispose over 51,000 items on our platform. On average, these students recycle about 25 items each month. We had a 33% average MAU throughout the spring semester. Next slide. So we are Techstars backed and we were also part of AWS's Impact Accelerator for Women Founders, um, which really re helped us create a really strong foundation for our company. Next slide. And I couldn't have, couldn't have done this work alone. Ryan Walden is my co-founder and CTO. He is a machine learning engineer with years experience building machine learning models. Um, and I've worked in the sustainability field for the last five years um, doing this research around consumer behavior. Next slide. So right now we're focusing on universities, um, like I said before, because of the product market fit. But it's also a really great starting ground because of the location with the college students. We believe by that by starting with universities, we'll be able to, one, build a really great case study to really show how it can be effective into other markets. Next slide. So I invite you to join. Today, we're actually raising our pre-seed round, 750K. Um, and so we are on a mission to transform recycling in the United States. And I invite you all to join us. Thank you. That was very good, Nicole. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Vasant, let's, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Appreciate it. Uh, how are you getting the information on the rules or regulations for the individual materials? Are you getting them from the university or from the municipality? How, how are you getting or taking in all that information? Exactly. So we are working with, that's why we're working with these organizations specifically, because they've already outlined exactly what's acceptable, what's not acceptable on their campuses. So by working with them, we're able to get those rules, those regulations, and surface it back to the students. Um, so that's how we do that today. And right now, there isn't a database that has data on what is recyclable across specific localities. And that is really what we're building. Um, and that is what we're really working towards is creating that database so that we can show what's acceptable across these various locations. Great. And do you, do you have to, uh, I know you can take a picture of mm -hmm. it and record it and that way it'll, it'll go into your system and read it back to them. Uh, do they have to download an app? Um, or... Yes, mm -hmm. they do. So they download the application. Um, and then once they log in with their student email, it has all of the correct recycling guidelines when they take the images on the platform. Got it. And then one, one last question. What, what's next after universities? What would be next for you? What, what would uh, make this even bigger? Yeah, so we're going to corporate offices um, and municipalities. So right now we're actually in conversations with Cox Enterprises to launch on their headquarter campus. So we're going ahead and start testing out what this application could look like on a corporate office, but our goal is to go to corporate offices, municipalities, and then eventually the general market. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Nicole, uh, super exciting to hear uh, your traction in particular. So I'm curious if you can share a little bit more about what you've learned uh, with the 51,000, I believe you said, um, students that have used the, the platform or it, uh, instances of use. What have you learned? What's kind of the user behavior? How are you tweaking the product based on what you've learned so far on the two campuses that you're currently live on? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, one of the biggest learnings I think we had, because we had focus groups, we did a lot of surveys this past semester, and we wanted to really understand the drivers of why students continue to use the application, um, because we saw that students were using the app on a weekly and monthly basis but only 12% of our students actually redeemed rewards. So what we learned is that the rewards were a really great way to acquire users to the platform, but what was keeping them was being able to track how their sustainability footprint has improved over time, in addition to the leaderboard where they could actually compete against other students on campus. Um, and so when we spoke with students, we learned that that's one of the biggest drivers um, in being able to compete with like their friends. So now, we're going to lean a little bit more into that social aspect on the application um, so that we can create more feedback loops between networks of students on campus. So like 
one example, one feature that we're going to implement is um, recycling challenges between your with, between your friends, as well as getting a notification when your friend has reached a recycling goal and stuff like that. So those social things have allowed have actually been the biggest driver of use versus the rewards, which was surprising, even though students still do. Um, but those are the things that we've we've learned so far. Awesome. So it sounds like you've kind of gamified recycling a bit on campus and there's motivation from students who want to be uh, at the top of the leaderboard. Do you see that as a strategy to grow into new campuses where um, maybe students are telling their friends that are at different universities about your product and they can sign up that way or are you thinking about it at all as a growth driver for you? Definitely. Um, because one thing that we found was that even the competitions between Georgia Tech and Georgia State were a big deal. Um, so I think that that's a really great way for us to launch onto other campuses is by doing like challenges between universities, um, like competitive rivalries between these institutions. But that is something we're definitely um, looking to tap into. Awesome. And one quick last question on the tech side. I know something about computer vision and using technology to take pictures uh, and find, you know, answers to things. So curious how you're building the technology and how you're thinking about those models. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so right now we're using OpenAI's clip model for the detection of the materials. And so what it's doing is it's matching the caption that it's creating for the image to what's in our database. So we have a database of all the acceptable materials. Um, and then we feed back that back to the user. Um, so right now we're in the process of actually building our own machine or our own models around this for improved detection. Um, but happy to dig a little bit deeper on that with you later on because I know we're we're catching on time. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. That was that was very well done. Um, just some a compliment to you. You very well spoken and you explained the technology very well. Thank you so much. Thank you for All the opportunity. Right. Yeah, All best right. of luck to you and keep in touch. Definitely. Okay, we got one more today. Uh, we have Alcide Honoré. Alcide's coming to us from Bill's Bill's Eye. I really like that name. Alcide, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear All me? All right. Yes, absolutely. Where are you guys located in Atlanta? We're located in uh, Pond City Market, actually. Same building as uh, Eco, which oh. I just found out today. That's great. You know, uh, that, that actually happens a lot at our meetups. People will meet their neighbors, and I just love that about it. So uh, with that said, uh, you have five minutes to present Bill's Eye, starting now. Okay, perfect. Good afternoon. My name is Alcide Honoré. I'm CEO and co-founder of Bill's Eye. And if you'll close your eyes for a moment and imagine a scenario. You're on vacation at the beach, relaxing in a lounge chair, enjoying the morning sun, feeling a smooth sea breeze across your face and warm sand in between your toes. If you're like most of us, you've got your mobile phone nearby to take pictures. And suddenly, you get a call from that all-important client. You know, the one that pays their bills on time. And after a 20-minute conversation about the latest emergency, you're now buying everyone ice cream to apologize for ignoring them. Next slide. Well, guess what? If you have ever found yourself in this scenario, you're not alone. Because nowadays, work from anywhere means work everywhere. And no matter whether you're at home, you're in the office, or on vacation, your clients expect to reach you on your personal mobile device. Next slide. Well, why is this a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because 40% of those calls go unbuilt. And if you're a person that bills for your time, like myself, I'm an attorney by trade, you're losing big money that you've already earned. And that is unacceptable. Next slide. What's the solution? Well, the solution is Bill's Eye. We've invaded your call screen and added a third button. So when you receive a call, you press the green button when mom calls, you press the blue button when you receive a client call. Next slide. How does it work? Well, once you've entered your hourly rate, you press that blue button and Bill's Eye starts tracking that time at your hourly rate. When a call concludes, you're given the option to make a note or a memo. So remember what you talked about. And then you can custom download all of that data for billing and record keeping. Next slide. 
well, what if you're not a lawyer or a, a accountant or a consultant that already has established clientele that you just need to build the margins for, but you're an influencer or you're a gig worker and you not only need to track that time, but you actually need to get paid as well. Well, we've invented a custom payment flow that will ensure that you get paid for every call, every single time. Next slide. Our competitors are web-based platforms that have a companion app. And somehow, while you're already on the phone, you're supposed to launch another app and click a button to start a timer to keep track of your time. Then you're supposed to somehow launch that app again to stop the timer. Billseye has completely automated that process. All you have to do is click our client button when you receive a call and the app does everything else. Next slide. We have an ambitious yet achievable roadmap. Our solution will be integrated at every particular place where people communicate with clients. In fact, we've already got a plugin built uh, for Google Meets. Next slide. Pricing. So we know we can go up on this pricing. We've got focus groups that told us we could actually charge roughly $14.99 uh, to monthly customers. However, right now we're charging $8 a month. We've recently stopped certain clients from being able to reload a free trial. And so far we have a relatively small number of 345 users uh, paying us each month to use the application. Next slide. However, at scale, based on the universe of service professionals around the globe and part-time gig workers and folks in the influencer economy, we can certainly hit these ambitious numbers. Next slide. So far, we've got over 30,000 downloads and two issued patents. Next slide. Our goal is to continue to build user community, and we appreciate the recognition we've already received from leaders in the industry, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, well, thank you very much. You ended right on time, and I really appreciate that. Okay, Jewel, let's start with you this time. Yes, hey, I'll see. It's good to see you. Yes, um, my question is, what do you think is driving um, the difference between the 30,000 downloads and the 345 paid users you have, what was, um, why aren't people paying and what are you going to do to drive those paid users? Well, we just started charging some people, um, okay. <laughs> folks that we've noticed are actually, um, showing the highest amount of billable time that they've recorded on the application. And we continue and, and so our goal is twofold, right? We definitely want to get the people to pay who we think will pay, but ultimately we see integrating the payments option as what's really going to put us in the best position to scale um, our earnings and realize our full earnings potential. So we also got to do what we've got to do to maintain as many daily active users as we can. So we're trying to surgically do it so we don't turn off people that maybe are not using us quite as much but because as long as they have bills on their phone, it activates on every incoming and outgoing call automatically. Okay. And so curious, how, do, how have you reached those 30,000 users that you have today? And what's the target, um, let's just say, in the next 12 months as far as number of downloads? Well, in the next 12 months, we want to get to 100,000 downloads. And so far, we've reached folks through digital marketing, and there have there are some sites that post APKs, um, you know, where folks kind of in the, um, you know, global developer community just kind of share applications. And so we've got some users from Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and Brazil that we have no idea exactly how we got them, but we're glad that they're there. And we're, we know, however, that digital advertising works. And that's something that we're going to continue to do. Great. 
I mean, thanks for thanks for thanks for presenting. Uh, appreciate it. Of uh, that sure. that TAM number is enormous. Um, in that number of it was a dollar amount, but in that number of users, that the, it's got to be a significant number of users that make up that that TAM. Are there any subcategories that are just massive, like lawyers or? Any other categories of people who who bill hours who might be a little bit more bite sized community to go after, right? And so, as an attorney, right, that's sort of the natural sort of first bite at the apple for me. Um, and the guidance that has led us to this number has really come from our users. Um, we were shocked to find out that roughly thirty five percent of our users are under twenty five years old. This required us to kind of go back to the drawing board with our roadmap, you know, because step by step, everything has been about, hey, servicing these, you know, suit and tie hourly billing professionals. And that's how we came up with the payments model. And we realized that that's actually going to be, you know, over time, our best opportunity to scale. So that number includes your lawyers, consultants, and accounting professionals globally as well as the community of influencers and gig workers. I mean, you know, half of the people that actually pay us each month for the app are therapists, um, which was not an originally expected user base. That's great. That's that's great. Uh, some, sometimes with these communities, you can go in through sort of associations or uh, or things like that, whether they're regional or national or, or whatever, to try to acquire large groups of customers all at once, you know, instead of instead of word of mouth, which is fantastic when it happens, but could be kind of kind of expensive. So. Alcide, I, I have one question for you too, right? So what what is the ideal user for this app in your head? All right. All right. Our ideal user is anyone that sees the value in their verbal communication. You know, there are folks, we've got Clubhouse, right? We've got folks that are booking time on Calendly. We've got this explosion of people that are not just lawyers and consultants, but also, you know, everyday folks that are looking for different ways they can monetize their impact in the economy, right? So why not a YouTube influencer with 10 million followers why shouldn't they be able to directly communicate with their followers and get paid for that? Right now, there's no good way for them to do so. Okay, great. And, and one last thing, is this only on Android? Right now, it's only on Android. We are in a process of raising to build a solution for the very expensive uh, and uh, much more um, restrictive iOS platform. Yeah. yeah, I guess that that question comes from the fact that Apple won't let you take over the phone app, right? And so what we've what we've done to solve that is actually partner with Vonage to get additional phone numbers that we can use that folks can call. Oh, we great. create our own call log with that number, and then we can do all of the same things with the app. The difference, of course, is that you've got to use a different phone number. And hopefully over time, we'll be able to actually use the native uh, phone number on the on the iPhone. But of course, having a separate number, there are expenses associated with scaling that. And so right now that's not our priority. We want to grow the product that we already have and you know, looking forward to raising the funds necessary to penetrate iOS, which obviously is a huge market. Obviously. All right, Elseed. Well, thank you so much for joining. I, I appreciate the pitch. Best of luck to you, sir. Thank you. All right. And and Jewel and Vasant, thank you so much for being the judge. I, I, this has been a great event for us. TechCrunch loves doing these city spotlight things. I don't live in Silicon Valley. I've never lived there. And so I care deeply about, about the what they like to call the flyover states. And so it, it's great to feature these, these areas. Next up, we're going to Portland, I believe. So stay tuned for that information. Well, that concludes this TechCrunch Live City Spotlight Atlanta edition. I hope everyone had a great time. And who's going to win this, this pitch off? You got to watch our Twitter account. We're going to tweet that out in a few minutes after we talk to the judges. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next time.